Once again, happy Father's Day. <laughs> My wish for all of you is that you find the right and perfect way to honor and thank your father or the father figure in your life. And, and the reason I say father figure is not out of uh, some kind of misguided political correctness. I think it's important to recognize that not everyone has a connection with their biological father. And for many others, that connection might not be healthy or happy. So for those who find themselves in either one of those places, we want you to know that Father's Day is not a lost cause. You're not alone. Believe it or not, there are some major characters in the Bible who share your story. You know, I always shake my head in amazement when I hear uh, conservative Christian folks talking about uh, how the Bible provides this perfect picture of traditional marriage and fatherhood and family values and things like that. Because whenever I hear that kind of talk, it tells me something very important. It tells me that those folks have never read the Bible. <laughs> For example, Traditional marriage in the Bible is polygamy. It's all over the place. The major male role models in the Hebrew Scriptures have multiple wives. Multiple wives or um, other, other arrangements, shall we say. For, for example, Abraham. Now this is the guy that we hear being called Father Abraham, right? Well, Father Abraham had a wife named Sarah. Sarah couldn't have children. She was barren, which was a really, really bad thing in that culture because the most important thing was to carry on and preserve the male bloodline. So the traditional definition of marriage allowed Abraham to have a child with his wife's maidservant. How convenient. <laughs> and Sarah, she had nothing to say except Go ahead. Now, later on, when Sarah finally gave birth to a son, good old family values Abraham told the maidservant and her child, really his child, to hit the road. He banished them from the tribe, sent them out into the desert because it was no longer convenient to have them around. Now that he had a heir, he had a, a legitimate son. And, and of course, you know, it gets even better because uh, when his legitimate son... Isaac gets a little bit older. Remember what Abraham tries to do? He tries to kill him. Remember that story? Yeah, I know the story says that God told him to do it. But um, there comes a time when you really have to start questioning those voices in your head. <laughs> and, 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 and poor Isaac. You, you would think poor Isaac is destined for a life of intensive therapy. <laughs> but he actually turns out okay. He turns out great. He's a good father. He is an actual role model for a male parent. And yet, when Isaac is in his old age, he's getting old, he's going blind, how is he repaid for being such a good father all his life? Well, his youngest son, Jacob, swindles him. Jacob pulls off this con job and deceives dear old dad into giving Jacob the right of inheritance that actually belonged to the older son named Esau. And Esau spends the rest of that story plotting his revenge. All right, and, and, and there you have it. Another dysfunctional family for the ages. <laughs> and I say all of this, I say all of this not to mock these stories, far from it. These, these stories, they're important. They're relevant. You know what these stories tell me? They tell me that they were written by living, breathing human beings who are having the same kinds of life experiences all the way back then that we see around us today. Our role models, our parental figures, are often flawed. They don't live up to our expectations of perfection. 
And when that happens, we don't hate them for it. Well, well maybe we do for a while. <laughs> but the best thing we can do in those situations is to learn from it. These stories are, are opportunities to learn. It's been going on for a long, long time. It continues to go on today. Our parental figures can be flawed. They can be imperfect. So can we. And our imperfections are often the greatest teachers of wisdom. They can lead to compassion and forgiveness. It's part of the evolutionary process, learning from our imperfections and our flaws and those that we see around us instead of condemning them and judging them. Use it as a learning opportunity, an opportunity to evolve. So now I want to shift focus from the, uh, from the Hebrew scriptures to the uh, Christian scriptures where we find two parental figures who actually do live up to expectations. Mary and Joseph. And since it's Father's Day, we're going to focus on Joseph. Now, in unity, when we look at these kind of Bible stories, we like to take in the, the surrounding historical and cultural context, and then we like to look at the symbols and the, and the metaphors that the story is trying to commute, because all stories are, to some degree, symbolic. There's a meaning behind the literal characters and words and phrases and things like that. So one of the ways that we can look at Mary and Joseph are as symbols of love and wisdom. In mythic and symbolic language, love is a, is a primary feminine trait. Wisdom is a primary masculine trait. Men and women have both traits. Everyone, male and female, can manifest love and wisdom. It's just a question, really, of which one we tend to lead with. So one of the ways that we can define wisdom comes from a, a unity book called The Revealing Word. And it has three ways of looking at wisdom. First, intuitive knowing or spiritual intuition, or mental action based on the Christ truth within, and finally, knowledge of worldly things with the ability to use them. I like that definition because it's integral. That means that it takes into account both the tangible and the intangible side of reality. And uh, it's interesting because if we take the gospel stories literally, which we don't, but if you take them literally, Joseph wasn't supposed to be the biological father of Jesus, was he? But none of that's really relevant. Because, for all practical purposes, Joseph was his father. He still had to make all the tough decisions. And even though he disappears from these stories early on, we have to conclude, I think, we have to conclude that his boy turned out okay. <laughs> Joseph did it right. He did something right. But it didn't have to be that way. Joseph had a choice in all of this. No matter what you might believe about this story, whether you believe that God was the father or whether Mary had an affair or whether she was raped or whatever some of those other stories are out there, the appearance to the rest of the world at that time was that Mary had been somehow unfaithful to Joseph. Joseph had a choice. He didn't have to step into the role of father figure for Jesus. He would have been justified in saying, no thanks, not my kid, not my problem. Joseph had this choice because human beings have free will. We're not puppets on a stage. We have the freedom to behave as badly and as selfishly as we want. And this is where Joseph really earns the status of father and father figure. Because this story shows us that free will has to be guided by wisdom. Joseph could have done three things here. He could have publicly denounced Mary, which might have led to her being stoned. He could have uh, quietly released her from her promise to marry him. Or he could have decided to see it through. And we know what his first decision was, right? His initial decision was to quietly release her. 
Free will means that we get to behave as selfishly as we choose. And we all know that human beings, well, we do have a bit of a selfish impulse, don't we? That was Joseph's first choice. Give in to the selfish, ego-driven impulse that said, no thanks, not my kid, not my problem. But the story says that he was visited by an angel in a dream, which is a symbolic way of saying that he had second thoughts. He couldn't sleep at night. He couldn't live with himself after making that decision. In other words, he had a conscience. Earlier when we defined wisdom, one of the definitions was mental action based on the Christ truth within. That's what we need to counter that selfish impulsiveness that we all have. It's what we need really to counter any kind of impulsiveness. And for Joseph, his, conscious, his conscience awakened this inner source of wisdom, this, this ability to make a different choice that was based on the Christ truth within. Joseph chose to be what we might call today a stand-up guy. The Urban Dictionary defines a stand-up guy as a loyal and trustworthy friend. Someone that Mary could count on. She needed a loyal and trustworthy friend to count on because this whole situation was turning out to be very difficult and very confusing. And the reason I like that term, stand-up guy, is because it's grounded in the idea of friendship, loyalty, and trust. In our contemporary culture still has this sick message that it sends out to our young men and boys. Despite all the advances that we've made, they're still socialized to some degree to treat women as a form of conquest and property. It's out there. All you have to do is open your eyes. And I know that, I know that sounds harsh, but it's still a prevalent theme probably has something to do with our, our materialistic values that have become ingrained in us since the Industrial Revolution. And yet, 2,000 years ago, someone wrote this story about a stand-up guy named Joseph who shows us that friendship, loyalty, and trust have to be the foundation of all of our relationships. All of them. When Karen and I do uh, wedding counseling or marriage counseling, we always try to find out if the, uh, if the couple started out as friends, maybe even best friends before anything else. I I'm convinced that starting out as best friends is the best foundation for a happy marriage. That's how it is for me and Karen. That's how it started off. That's how it is today. That's the kind of thing that we want to see our fathers and our father figures pass on to the next generation by, by words and by example. Joseph changed his mind. He made the choice to change his mind and to stand by Mary and support her despite the appearances. And that's another part of the selfish impulse, isn't it? To be constantly worried about what other people think of us. Narcissism. Narcissism, it's running rampant in the world today. And instead of just offering a, a definition of narcissism, here's a graphic that explains it rather nicely. <laughs> There's the universe. There's me in the center of it. And revolving around me is the entire universe. My stuff, stuff about me, stuff I hate. And all the way out there on the very outside ring is a tiny speck for others. That's how it works. That is narcissism. And you can always tell when you're talking to a, to a narcissist, right? Because they go on and on and on talking about themselves. And then they finally pause to catch a breath. And they say, well, that's enough about me. Let's talk about you. What do you think of me? That's, yeah. We live in a culture obsessed with appearances, and the message that we get today is the same message that Joseph got all those years ago. A man does a, a manly man does not put up with infidelity. Culture tells us it's more important to keep up appearances than it is to do the right thing. Wisdom says it's more important to do the right thing 
than keeping up appearances. Joseph, a symbol of wisdom. He does the right thing despite appearances. And of course, one of the things we remember best about Jesus is that when he became an adult, he did the same thing. He would call out the self-righteous. He would call out the ones who would put on elaborate shows of great holiness and piety. He called them whited sepulchers, clean and pure looking on the outside, but inside filled with all sorts of darkness and corruption. He called out the people who went around making a big deal, a big show of being seen praying in public. There's a lot of that going on around us today. All sorts of places are trying to write it into our laws that you're going to make this big show of being seen praying in public. And uh, they kind of forgot about this little passage in the Gospel of Matthew which says this. It says, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Once again, they apparently didn't read the Bible. So, here's the summary of all things that we can learn from the story of Joseph. Good advice for Father's Day and really any other day of the year for that matter. Joseph shows us that we're free agents and that free will works best when it's guided by our inner wisdom. The other thing he tells us is to pause and consider that there might be more than one possibility. The universe always presents us with multiple possibilities at each point in time as we go forward. He tells us that wisdom is the power that we can use to rein in our ego-driven impulses. It's the counter to our human impulsiveness. We need to discern between what is a true choice that we're making consciously versus a subconscious reaction driven by all of that cultural conditioning that gets ingrained to us from the moment that we're old enough to really begin to hear and make sense of the world. Joseph shows us that loyalty, trust, and friendship should be the foundation of all of our relationships. And uh, finally, Joseph shows us that uh, it's more important to do the right thing than to keep up appearances, and that life isn't all about me. Don't be a narcissist. Life isn't all about me, my stuff, the stuff I like, the stuff I don't like, and what people think of me. There's way more to it than that. So, there are so many things that, that, that our fathers and father figures can teach. And, uh, you know, learning how to go fishing or plant a garden or fix a bicycle or stuff around the house, those are all great things. They're practical, they're useful, but uh, has to be more to it than that. So, my, my wish for you in closing today is that we learn how to be, we learn how to be, stand-up guys or girls, passing on the power of wisdom by, by word and by example. So go out there and teach wisdom. See you next time.